Let's read chapter one from the book of James. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. Verse 11. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, it flower, its flower falls, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Verse 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of firstfruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Verse 21, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror, for he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religious is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. That's James chapter 1, verses 1 through 27. To whom is the book of James written? Who is the author? The book of James was written to the scattered 12 tribes of Israel. This means that it was written to the descendants of Israel also known as Jacob, and they were under the law. We believe that the human author is James, the half-brother of Jesus, for several reasons. First, James was the leader of the kingdom church in Jerusalem. Second, he was not one of Jesus' disciples during his earthly ministry. Third, he kept the law and the kingdom gospel while recognizing Paul's apostleship to the Gentiles. According to verses 2 through 4, what produces patience? Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. Since the Holy Spirit produces it in the lives of believers, we can demonstrate its power during times of testings. The beauty about patience 
is that it enables us to be complete. As long as we have patience, we lack nothing. Explain the importance of faith. Faith is taking God at his word, and it has been important since the beginning of time. Today, we can demonstrate faith when we walk in the spirit. We can ask God to give us his wisdom in all things. Verses 12 through 16 explain the importance of enduring temptation. How can we apply it today? Remember, the book of James was written to Messianic Jews under the law. So there are certain truths that will be applicable to the future Messianic Jews. One of these truths is the issue of enduring temptation. The past Jews were more likely to have been tempted to be self-righteous in following the law. The Jews in the future will be tempted to follow the Antichrist. However, we are, we are under grace today. Thus, we can apply these principles to our daily lives in every situation. Since our flesh is sinful, it can be enticed to do evil things, such as adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, wrath, and so on. Therefore, it is very important to endure the temptation by relying on the Holy Spirit. While we may not be able to avoid situations or people who tempt us to sin, we can trust in God to help us not to sin. You can read 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Thus, walking in the Spirit enables us to endure temptations. What does being doers of the word mean according to verses 22 through 25? Verse 19 states, Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. To be doers of the word, we must listen to God's word and do what it says. If we do not obey it, then we are deceived. In order for spiritual growth to occur, we must rely on God's word. It's very clear from the scriptures that we must continuously dwell on God's word so we will not forget it. Let's look at James chapter 2. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. For if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, and there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes, and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes, and say to him, You sit here in a good place. And say to the poor man, you stand there, or you sit here at my footstool. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? Verse 6. But you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into courts? Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Verse 10. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point he is guilty of all. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. 
Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Verse 20. But do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Verse 25. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. James chapter 2, verses 1 through 26. What does it mean in verse 8, you shall love your neighbor as yourself? It means exactly what it says. We must love others in the same way that we love ourselves. This is impossible to do apart from the Holy Spirit. Since love is a fruit of the Spirit, we must allow him to work in our lives. We can offer ourselves as living sacrifices unto the Lord, according to Romans 12. James teaches in verses 14 through 26 that faith without works is dead. But the Apostle Paul teaches that we should walk by faith, not by sight. How are these two doctrines different? Note, if you are confused, please refer to my Galatian study guide on this channel. James teaches that faith without works is dead because he was instructing Jews who were under the Mosaic law. Since the fall of Adam and Eve, God has required blood sacrifices. Under the law, Israelites had to do many works to earn God's forgiveness of their sins. They had to continuously go to the priest to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. During Christ's time, they had to be water baptized. Today, however, we're under grace. We no longer have to do works for our salvation. In this dispensation, we can come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. His death, burial, and resurrection satisfied God's requirement for the forgiveness of sin. The only thing that we must do to obtain God's forgiveness is to believe by faith in the finished cross work of Jesus Christ. It's a personal decision, so no one can make it for you. Even if you have done good deeds or have been immersed in water, or if you have attended church your entire life, these works cannot save you from the lake of fire. You must recognize that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. You must ask God to forgive you of all your sin. Tell him that you believe in his son's death, burial, and resurrection. Thank him for his complete forgiveness of your sin. If you have made this important decision, you can rejoice in knowing that God loves you and that you are now in his family. You can learn more about God by reading his word, studying it with other believers, and praying for his wisdom. Although we do not have to do good works to earn our eternal salvation, we can still do good things for the Lord. What are some things that we can do to show our gratitude? There are many good things that we can do for our love for the Lord. We can help those in need. We can invest our time, money, and resources into ministries that are faithful to God's word. And we can offer our services to those who cannot repay us. Anytime that we make a sacrifice for others, it is a love offering to God. Let's praise him for all that he has done for us. Now let's look at chapter 3. James chapter 3. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing 
that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea, is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no one can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Verse 10. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. Verse 15. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. James explains in detail about the importance of guarding our words. What steps can we take to tame our tongues? Since our hearts are desperately wicked, according to the prophet Jeremiah, we must guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. How do we do it? We must diligently study the scriptures. By reading and meditating on God's word, we are learning his ways. By praying to God, we are fellowshipping with him. The more time we spend with him, then the more we can become like him. As we study the Bible, our minds become clean. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, which means that he is setting us apart from evil. So if our thoughts are pure, then our words and actions will be pure. Thus, we must guard our minds in Christ Jesus if we want to tame our unruly tongues. Here's a practical tip. Listen to others first. According to verses 14 through 15, sinful thinking leads to corrupt words. What should motivate us from dwelling on evil things? We know that our hearts are desperately wicked, according to Jeremiah 17, 9. So we should realize that our natural thinking does not please God. If it doesn't please God, then it is demonic. Thus, we should be motivated to think holy thoughts so that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Since he indwells believers, we must always be on guard to protect our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice that confusion is mentioned in verse 16. Where did confusion originate? Confusion originated with Satan in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Eve. Disguised as a shrewd serpent, Satan questioned her about God's commandment regarding not eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Since Eve was confused, 
Satan lied to her, saying that she would not die. Of course, we know now that they eventually died. It was never God's plan for Adam and Eve to have a conscience of knowing good and evil. He provided the perfect home for them, and it was all taken away when Adam sinned. You can read 1 Timothy 2.14 on your own. In this dispensation, we can come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, according to Hebrews 4.16. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. Let's continue now, chapter 4. Let's read James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Verse 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell, and make a profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 17. Chapter 4 begins by asking four questions. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Let's answer these questions from the scriptures. According to Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 24, the inward man, which is the spirit, delights in the law of God. But the sinful flesh desires to control the mind so that it can keep the body in bondage. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So where does evil come from? It comes from three sources. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, according to 1 John 2, 15 through 16. Therefore, those who love the world cannot love the Lord. God will not tolerate sharing his deity with anyone or with anything. What does it mean to resist the devil? 
Only the Lord can help Christians to resist Satan. Since we're fighting a spiritual battle, Christians must put on the full armor of God. Even Jesus spoke scripture when he resisted Satan. Thus, we should also quote scripture. God's word is living, powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword. We must rely on God at all times because only he is our great defender. Walking in humility pleases the Lord. How can we be humble according to verse 10? We can be humble by obeying God's holy commandments. He instructs us to love others as we love ourselves. How do we show God's love to people? We can serve them. We can honor them. We can respect them. And we can invest in them. Simple acts, such as helping strangers with random acts of kindness, can go a long way in being Christ-like. Volunteer work is always appreciated as well as helping out in the community. If you can't drive to places, you can pray for people. There's always something to do for others, and it does not have to cost you anything. Just aim to serve rather than expect others to serve you. Verse 14 says that our life is a vapor. What can we do with this short period of life that we're given? Since our lives are not our own, we should use God's time and his resources for his glory. Did you know that everything you have belongs to God? The air you breathe, the food you eat, your marriage, your children, your finances, and everything else belongs to God. We are only temporary stewards of his possessions. This means that we owe everything to God. So we must trust him to help us to be faithful stewards of his resources. Now, let's look at chapter 5. Let's read James chapter 5. Now you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabbath. You have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in a day of slaughter. You have condemned you have murdered the just. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Verse 10. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain 
and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. Verses 1 through 6 are about the rich taking advantage of the poor. How can we help those in need? In this letter, James was warning the rich that they were going to suffer the consequences for stealing from the poor. Nothing is hidden from God. It is clear from the scriptures that he has compassion for the weak and poor, particularly the orphans and widows. In the same way, we are supposed to have compassion for the weak and the poor. We can extend God's kindness to them and not expect anything in return. We can help those who are truly in need, those who do not know when they will eat next, those who do not have lodging, and those who may be in danger for their lives. Let's remember to be hospitable to those in need for Christ's sake. James cautioned the Messianic Jews, those who were under the law, not to grumble against one another, or they would be condemned. What does the Apostle Paul teach us about condemnation today? Praise God. Today, we're under grace. This means that we are Christians, and we are not condemned for our sins. Those of us who have trusted in Christ as our personal Savior can rest assured that our sin debt was paid in full when the Lord Jesus died on the cross for our sin. When we asked him to forgive us of our sins, he forgave us completely. This does not mean that we can sin. Instead, we should be so grateful for God's mercy that we don't want to grieve him. According to verse 15, the prayer of faith will save the sick. How is this verse, and verse taken out of context today? In this context, the prayer of faith will save the sick means that their action determines the outcome. Remember, these were Messianic Jews living under the Mosaic law. They had to do works to please God. There were 613 laws that they were supposed to obey. If they obeyed God, then they would be blessed. Today, under grace, we are not required to do works to earn God's approval. The only thing that he requires today is to have faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sin. We should always have faith in God, and we should obey his word. Out of 613 laws, only nine of them are reaffirmed by the Apostle Paul. According to Romans 13, 9, we should not commit adultery. We should not murder. This includes killing the unborn. We should not steal. We should not lie. We should not covet. We should love the Lord our God. And we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Therefore, to answer the question, verse 15 is taken out of context because people think that if they have enough faith, then they will be healed. While we should always have faith in the Lord, we should not place our faith in sinful humans. For instance, in some churches, the pastors claim to be faith healers. While God can use humans to heal people, it is not the humans who are doing the healing. It is God. Only he is the great physician. Even the Apostle Paul was not able to heal Timothy when he had stomach issues. Therefore, let us rely on God for healing, not on sinful humans. Only God is enough. As the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God's grace is sufficient. Therefore, let us continue to pray for one another and put our faith in Christ. I hope these scriptures are a blessing to you as they are to me. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Thank you.
and God bless you.